before I start with a summary of the work, I'll give you a little bit of the overall background of what the research um, was inspired by. Oh, I have this. So, fossil based materials, also known as plastics, they were developed around 70 years ago. And uh, they are high performing, very durable, and we can manufacture them at a very high volume. Unfortunately, they're not very sustainable. The production alone uh, produces several, um, a significant percentage of the carbon emissions, and it, because it's so durable, it doesn't really um, degrade in nature, which ends up loitering in, um, littering in our oceans and accumulating in landfills. If we would like to move on to a more sustainable society, we need some sustainable materials. Materials that can be bio-based, they can degrade, and they, or they can support a more circular economy. A suitable material should be cellulose. Cellulose has excellent mechanical properties, is abundant, is renewable, and is supported by an already established industry, the pulp and paper industry. There are several challenges, though. High manufacturing costs from bio-based uh, materials are a problem when you want to compete with plastics. Additionally, you, have, you cannot really match the properties from plastic materials. And we need to make them for more advanced applications if we keep moving to the future. Which makes me, makes me go to the first thesis objective. We'd like to get new properties for the cellulose fibers by incorporating macromolecules within the fiber wall structure. I, this is quite broad, so I have a few objectives. The, like deeper understanding of the fibrillar structure using cellulose nanofibrils. Uh, have a better methodology for the introduction of functional macromolecules within the nanocellulose structure, and have similar methodologies so we can apply them back to the fibers. Along the course of my thesis, I explored other materials that support the, the following sustainable development goals, which are number three, number nine, and number 12. In this presentation, I will go through I have a quick introduction of the background of the work. I'll introduce you to the model for anisotropic fibular structures. I have polymer link fibular networks. I'll introduce you how to make them and how I can control the structure property relationships. I will show you how I do polymerization with the fiber wall, and then I conclude with some summary and conclusions. Starting from the wood, if you look at the tissue of the wood, you will see that it's made of several cells. We call them fibers. The fibers, yeah, the fibers have a layer structure, and the layers are conformed from cellulose nanofibrils, surrounded by hemicellulose in a matrix of lignin. In each of these layers, the cellulose nanofibrils are aligned in a separate direction, but in the thickest of all, we have cellulose nanofibrils aligned along the length of the fiber. If we would like to take advantage of all these uh, components, we need to separate them. Uh, we do through chemical and mechanical treatments. After the fiber is removed from all the lignin and hemicelluloses, we have a very porous anisotropic fibular structure made out of mostly nanofibrils. It contains large amounts of water, and the swelling is uh, usually susceptible to pH and ionic strength, meaning that it behaves similar to how polyelectrolyte gels behave. But how do they behave? So for electrolyte gels, they're similar to other polymeric gels. When liquid goes inside of the network, it expands it. And this expansion produces a difference in pressure between the inside and the outside of the network. That difference in pressure can be uh, defined in, a co in the sum of three components. The first one has to do with interactions between the solvent and the polymer. If the uh, interactions are favorable, the network will expand. If they're not, they will shrink. The net ones depends in the um, difference in ion concentration inside and outside the network. So the liquid will flow in and out of the network to keep the balance of the concentration, to try to reach an equilibrium of the concentration between the inside and the outside. Finally, we have a, a contribution from the network. Polymer gels, regular polymer gels, do not like to be extended. They like to call back. So when you expand the network, there will always be this opposition to try to call back. But when you think about the fibrils, there are uh, bundles of cellulose chains that are linear polymers and they're quite stiff. They cannot really coil back. So we need a new model to try to uh, describe nanofibrillar gels more accurately. 
That brings me to the first part of my thesis. So the elastoplastic model for anisotropic fibular structures. As I mentioned, the fiber is an anisotropic porous structure made of nanofibril. One fiber is very small and it's very difficult to look at the network while I'm compressing at the same time. It's a few microns thick. But the nanofibrils can be separated. So we can subtract, um, extract all the nanofibrils and we can make a CNF dispersion. The dispersion can be vacuum filter and it can make into a nanopaper. The nanopaper can then be swollen into solutions of different ionic strength. And due to the way that we make these nanopapers, the network will swell in the, in the set direction. It will be anisotropic swelling. Then we can try to compress it in different ways to try to understand what will be the components between the network and the ions in the network. And this is what we got for a model. Inside of the network, we have several ions that as we are compressing, they are forced to be in a smaller and smaller uh, place. This uh, increases the pressure outwards, which is represented in a model by the, this can, oh, but this is spring. We also have the network that is physically entangled, which means we have contact points that are keeping the network together. As we are compressing it, the pressure needs to overcome the friction in the bond. When you be able to compress it and overcome this pressure, then it will start compressing um, plastically. That's defined by in our model by this uh, spring and the sleep stick. And in actual data, we should be able to see it as a change in uh, slope. Now, how it deforms plastically, it depends on the network. So if you have a network that is highly swollen and the bonds are not really, uh, there's a lot of electrostatic interaction, then it will, it will probably deform plastically at a sooner step. It will come an earlier and earlier onset of plastic deformation. But we, only, we don't have only one bond, so this is not <laughs> just, a, just one point for the whole network. We have thousands of fibrils at the same time, we have thousands of contacts. Therefore, we will have some local yielding certain place, which makes the model look more like round. After certain concentration that we are compressing them, we will reach a concentration in which they will be start, they will start to deform non-linearly, which means we get a densification of the network. And that's seen in this point. When we look into the, um, uh, our data, we will see the networks that were submerged into higher ionic strength, like 100 millimolar, they almost immediately deform plastically, eh, non-linearly. They start to densify. And this makes sense because they're very close to being at the densifying point in this concentration, so they start to uh, densify immediately. If we have networks that were swollen in a low ionic strength, they're very swollen. That means that we can compress them a little bit longer before it starts to densify. Now that we have a model of um, how they behave and what's the effect of the ions and the, the, and the joints, let's see if we can play around with it. Let's see if we can change the bond so we can have a little bit more uh, yield, we can um, tune it better. For this project, we use polymer-linked fibular structures, and for this, we use a special type of CNFs, cellulose nanofibrils. We did them tempoxidized, methylated CNFs. They will have colloidal stability thanks to the carboxylic content, and they will also have good reactivity thanks to the alkene groups in the methacrylates. To make a gel, we combine the CNFs, with some monomer. At the beginning, we wanted to try it out. So we started with small molecules like acrylamide. We introduced some initiator and applied the light. And we obtained this uh, nice looking hydrogel. <laughs> um, this one was made only one way percent CNF and one way percent monomer. But it still has very nice properties. For instance, it can dry and reswell in exactly the same shape that I made them. In fact, I try multiple times drying and reswelling and measure the water content at each point. And it was able to reswell to at least the same water content that the first time I made them. But how come that it can reswell in the same way? So to explore this, we did a small angle X-ray scattering on dry dispersions. We have one without any cross-linkings and one with my dry hydrogel. What you can see in the graph is that in the dispersion, there's really not much porosity which allows us to think that when the dispersion doesn't have any crosslinks, the fibrils are allowed to slide and they're going to make a very compact film, very dense film. 
But when you have the dry hydrogels, the links in between the fibrils that keep the network together are strong enough to overcome the capillary forces during drying, and then keeps the network structure even when it's dry. So when it uh, is swelling again, it comes back to the same place it was before. Now, the CNFs have a quite high charge. Therefore, they're quite sensitive to ionic strength. If you put one of the gels in a low ionic strength, they will swell, and the polymer links that are holding the network together, they will start to stretch as much as possible to allow the water to come into the network. But then when you put the network in a higher ionic strength solution, you screen the repulsion between the fibrils, the polymers are allowed to coil back, and the network shrinks. This has important implications in terms of mechanical properties of the network. If I have a gel in a low ionic strength, meaning very swollen, it ends up being much more brittle and softer than if you have it in high ionic strength. And we think that this is probably because when we allow the, the polymer coils to come back together, they have more time to uh, stretch and allow the network to withstand higher stresses before it breaks. This is important since if we want to apply for biomedical applications, all the applications come in isotonic solutions, and that's a very high ionic strength which means that depending on the solution, we can have a different um, performance. Okay, now we know that we can make it. We can have different properties if we put different types of polymers and have different solutions. But how can we make it better to try to understand a little bit more what are the, the parameters that make the structure? So we look into the structure property relationships of polymer linked networks. For this project, we use two types of CNFs and we use two types of polymers. I use exactly the same type of CNFs. I try to modify them as the same as possible. <coughs> well, I, they have different aspect ratio. They have ones that are MATO 400, that's the aspect ratio, and there's some that are MATO 1200. So ones are very, very long and skinny, and the other ones are not that long. <laughs> For the polymers, I wanted to use telekelic macromonomers. This is speculic, it means that you can have uh, two active units, two reactive units in, in the molecule. The reason is because I wanted to test the, the cross-linking density of the network and what would it affect in the mechanical properties. I also wanted something that was aqueous-based, degradable, and it was biocompatible, so we can continue to use in biomedical applications. I use spec diacrylate and dithiatrato, and I perform a step growth polymerization to obtain PEG DTT. PEG-DTT can change its molecular uh, weight if you change the ratios between the regions. So I tried several ratios, and I got the ones that will look farther away from each other, to have a small one and a big one, to have a fair comparison. Then we can compare them by seeing the mechanical properties, and I did that using photobiology. In this technique, you put them in the rheometer and you shine the light, and you can see the change in the storage modulus as a function of irradiation time. With high molecular weight polymers, if you don't have the metacolates in the CNF, the polymers do not make any gel at all. There's no really no network formation. But when you have the CNFs with the metacolates, you can see the difference in uh, aspect ratio, in, sorry, in storage modulus, and uh, you can see that it actually makes a proper structure. Furthermore, if we use low molecular weight polymers, these ones can make a network around the fibrils, but their properties are nothing compared to the ones that use methacrylate CNFs. And this gives us to think that it's more efficient to use the CNFs as an active part of the structure instead of using it as just reinforcements. These materials have very fun properties. I was able to twist them, stretch them, compress them. They were quite fun to work with. So to look into what are the mechanical properties of them, I came up with this uh, um, idea from the results. I came up with this uh, um, relation. If you want to have high modulus and higher stiffness, then you can get a uh, fibril aspect ratio quite high, but reduce the molecular weight of the polymers. If you need something more ductile and softer, you can reduce the aspect ratio of the fibrils and have longer mo uh, molecular weight in the polymer. So this was nice. This gave me an idea of how can I tune things? How can I make materials of different properties? But then how can we move this into the fibers? Are we actually able to do the same thing within the fiber wall? For this project, we utilize dual functionalization of cellulose fibers. 
we, in one step, we were able to introduce carboxylate functionality and alkene functionality. And everything was done in a acetic acid. It's a very green solvent. There was nothing uh, extra on it. And I was able to tune the modification based on the temperature. For the following uh, project, I will continue to use hydrogel since that's what I did before and that's what I wanted. How do I make a fiber reinforced hydrogel? I made it in three steps. I started with the thiolation via microaddition. I continue with oligomerization using a step growth polymerization. And I finish with a cross-linking. And I utilize different types of cross-linking. In the thiolation, my microaddition was done between the maleic hydride in the fibers and the thiotile trato. Using FDIR, I was able to check that the reaction was going forward the way that I was expecting, and that it was almost done at 30 minutes. After that, I was able to use tech diaculate, and this starts the step growth polymerization. It's the same type of chemistry that I used in the previous project. And as I learned in the previous project, I can switch the ratios between the regions to have different polymers. So for this project, I used the high molecular weight polymer and the low molecular weight polymer. And I checked that the polymerization was going on both in the bulk of the solution, but also on the fibers. Finally, I had some cross-linking for the fiber and force hydrogel. You can cross-link in two ways. You can have either UV-induced cross-linking or heat-induced cross-linking. When you use UV, it is heterogeneous since they, it depends on where the light can penetrate. Therefore, it is unlikely that it will go inside of the fibers. But there will be polymers inside of the fibers. So that will make a different gel. If you have heat induced cross linking, it depends more on where the heat is uh, when it reaches the temperature, temperature. It will be even if it's inside of the fibers. Wait. Therefore, we get four types of hydrogels. They're quite different in, uh, when you look at them. But then when you look deeper into the SEM, you will see that the coating that is covering the fibers is, uh, has a different structure. It seems to be quite coarse and very rough in for the ones that are heat-induced cross-linking, and it's very soft for the ones that are UV-induced cross-linking. But we need more information to know what's happening. So we try to compress them and see what will be the differences. In the case of the UV-induced cross-linking, again, it's very unlikely that the polymerization occurs within the fibers, but they have very long polymers inside. These potentially could act as plasticizers, which makes the fibers very soft and make it a very unlikely cross-linking, as you can see in the high molecular weight ones. For heat-induced cross-linking, we get a very different performance, and you can see that even inside of the fibers, we expect to have some cross-linking. Therefore, the material looks a little bit uh, stronger. To give you an idea of how strong these materials can be, this is a 500 milligram hydrogel holding a 200 gram weight but the hydrogel is made of 400 milligrams of water. So it's a very tiny amount of material that is holding such a big weight. To finalize uh, this project, we made fibers that were bio-based and with a fully green method. It would be great if we can degrade them back and see if we can retain the, the fibers. So what I did with this ones, I used the hydrogel, I put it back into a solution of pH 12 at 37 degrees, and I left it there for 48 hours. The hydrogel completely lost the shape, but I was able to collect the fibers and measure if all the polymers were cleaved off. And that's what I observed with the FDIR. We still require more investigations to know whether the fibers are suitable to be reused in other applications or if can still degrade in nature. We don't know still what can do all the, after all these modifications. Okay, to conclude, we did make an elastoplastic model of anisotropic fibular structures. We create a methodology for cross-linking fibular structures with tunable networks via polymer linkers of different sites. We successfully applied these methodologies to the fibers. And we tried to make fiber-reinforced networks with this technique. And along the way, we were able to develop a methodology for fully bio-based, dual-functionalized fibers. And that's all from me. I want to thank my dear supervisors, and my group, and everybody at BBSC. And thank you. All of you.